About a year ago, when we were finally coming out of a COVID lockdown situation, I was asked to give a live lecture again for teachers at a secondary school. And I was excited. It was going to be a talk about effective teaching strategies. Great topic, right up my alley. And I was discussing the content with the organizers when I overenthusiastically suggested the following. What about if I talk a bit about online learning? Whoa, it felt like I dropped a bomb. There was an awkward silence, and I thought I could actually see the teachers I was talking to relive their traumas of emergency remote teaching of that past COVID year. That was obviously not a good idea. And I can't blame them. How many of you have had negative experiences with emergency remote teaching? Please raise your hand. Well, that's quite a lot. And it's easy to relate to this. We all know or have experienced the examples of emergency remote teaching. Sitting next to your 10-year-old, trying to get her to focus on the online instruction, while also getting some of your own work done. Or walking in on your teenager, who's playing on their phone, while somewhere in the background the teacher is talking about math problems. Or a first-year student in higher education, who hasn't seen his classmates or his professors for an entire year. It's been quite a challenge, and it's completely understandable that the teachers I was talking to, or anyone else for that matter, would say goodbye online education. But now that we're coming out of the lockdown situation, it feels to many people like we need to make a choice about whether or not we're going to use online education in the future. But is that the real issue here? Let me explain. I'll give you an example. Ever since the development of new technologies, people have been interested in the question what effect those technologies may have on learning. So, for example, in the 1950s, when the television was becoming popular, people wanted to know whether getting instruction from a television screen would have the same effect as getting instruction in a classroom. So researchers had a teacher explain the use of a slide rule in a classroom and gave the same instruction to another group on a TV set. And guess what happened? There was no difference between online and offline learning. Another example, and this is a more recent one. About 10 years ago, a study was done in which students were taught about math topics, either live by a teacher or on a laptop computer. Now, important to note is that the learning circumstances were identical. So, both had the same materials and assignments. Both had the possibility to ask questions, either live or by chat, and they both used the same room. Now guess what happened? Again, there was no difference. Now, how is that possible? To answer that question, we need to know more about the science of learning. More specifically, we need to know more about the basics of how learning works. And for that, we need to talk about memory. Now, stay with me here, because here comes a bit of theory, OK? Learning can be seen as a long-lasting change in our long-term memory. And that can mean anything from learning simple vocabulary or facts to learning complex ideas like democracy, or even learning important skills like driving a car. Now, let me show you the basics of how memory works. First, information from the outside world enters into our working memory, where it's processed. And our working memory is limited in time and in capacity. So only a limited amount of information can stay in there for a limited amount of time. Then, to achieve these long-lasting changes that we're looking for, information is organized and integrated into our long-term memory, and our long-term memory serves as a more permanent memory store. Now, from long-term memory, information can be retrieved or remembered at a later time, and from both memory stores, information can be forgotten. OK, so far, so good? OK, now. Even based on this simple model, there are many ways in which we can improve learning. We can reduce the rate of forgetting simply by letting people rehearse what they need to know at a later time. 
We can facilitate retrieval or remembering of information by giving people cues that help them to find the words that they're looking for in their memory. So let's try that here, okay? Uh, I'm going to say a word, and then you're going to say the first word that pops into your mind. And very quickly. Here we go. Doctor. I heard somebody say nurse. Uh, so that means that doctor is a good cue to get nurse out of that person's long-term memory. Okay. Another example. Uh, we can improve the integration of new information with our existing knowledge. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say you want to teach six-year-olds new vocabulary. Let's say words that have to do with theater, like wings or stage set. Now then, if you talk to these students about their previous experiences with the theater, they will activate their prior knowledge about the theater, and they will integrate these new words into that prior knowledge, and that will help them to remember them better. Okay, final example. Um, we can reduce the pressure, the load on our limited capacity working memory. For example, we can direct the learner's attention to important information by highlighting it. That was quite a lot, but stay with me here because we're getting to the good stuff. Why did I explain all this? Because I want to make the point that learning is best whenever there's a good match between how students learn, how teachers teach, and these memory processes that we're discussing. But of course, in practice, that's not always the case. Students of all ages, from primary school to higher education, all use rereading the materials they need to know as a very dominant learning strategy. But we know that quizzing, doing practice tests, using flashcards, all make it a lot easier to remember the information that you're trying to practice. Also, many students cram all of the practice with new information into one single study session the day before the exam. But also here, memory research tells us that it's much better to spread practice across multiple days or even multiple weeks. And that will improve memory a lot more, especially on the long term. Now, this also has implication for our teachers. As teachers, we may tend to dive into a topic straight away when we give instruction. But now we know that first activating our prior knowledge of our students will help them to learn that information better. So as teachers, we could do a recap of what we did the lessons before, and that will make learning a lot easier. Or another example, let's say a physics teacher wants to teach his students about speed and acceleration. Now, what normally happens that is that after instruction, these students are going to solve problems on their own. But especially with very complex materials, this poses a much too high load on their working memory. So it would be much better to first let them study completely worked out examples of these problems and then let them sol solve problems on their own. So now we know a little bit more about how memory works. But what does that tell us about the discussion between online and offline learning? Let me give you some recent examples from research. And this one is from our own research. If you give students online reminders on their dashboards, to complete a set of online practice tests distributed across a couple of weeks before the exam, they score 20% higher on the final exam. Or another one, uh, students get a live geology lecture by a teacher, or they see an online video that includes questions and also online materials that help helps them to answer these questions. Also in that case, the second group performs better on the test. Now, what I'm hoping these examples are telling you is that learning is best when there's a match between how we learn, how we teach, and how our memory works, but completely regardless of whether it's online or offline. There are literally dozens of studies comparing offline versus online learning formats, and the only thing that determines which works better is whether the learning environment allows for processes to take place that actually stimulate learning like quizzing, like activating prior knowledge, like spreading practice over time. 
Okay. Now that was the tough part. Now let's go back to our experiences with emergency remote teaching. That was really bad. And for some of us, uh, using online education may have felt like learning how to ride a bike. And we may have stepped up on the bike a bit too fast and fallen off, causing traumas that now lead to the pointless discussion of whether we really need a bike to reach our destination. It's a, it's a bit like Paul McCartney said in 1967 when he sang, you say yes, I say no, you say stop, and I say go, go, go. The challenge now is to design the right combination of online and offline elements depending on your learning goals and on the tools that you have available. That also implies that we need to evolve as teachers and as learners and to reflect upon what we do and why we do this. So, as far as online education is concerned, I don't know why you say goodbye, I say hello.